Hello, my name is Laura Knight Yajik, and welcome to the Eruolus Breathing and Meditation Program. I want to extend a very warm welcome to all the readers of my books, all the readers who have followed my publications on the internet, all of you who have listened to various radio interviews over the years, and an especially warm welcome to those who have never heard of me and are getting acquainted via this video. I want to begin with a quote from George Gurdjieff. This is from In Search of the Miraculous, Fragments of an Unknown Teaching, which was a record of his experience with Gurdjieff written by P.D. Uspensky. Gurdjieff said, Write exercises which lead to the aim of mastering the organism and subjecting its conscious and unconscious functions to the will. Begin with breathing exercises. Without mastering breathing, nothing can be mastered. At the same time, to master breathing is not so easy. But aside from these very brief remarks, he didn't give us much in the way of indications or clues about exactly how one was to go about mastering their breathing and therefore being able to master their will. Breathing exercises are an integral part of yoga training and have been for centuries. It is claimed that mastering breath can produce almost instantaneous changes in an individual's physiology. And there have been many reports of yogis who mastered this kind of breath training who could perform extraordinary feats of endurance or production of heat or to be able to endure long periods of physical discomfort or exercise or exertion. Yet we come back to what Gurdjieff said, that right exercises, which lead to the aim of mastering the organism, begin with breathing. Without mastering breath, nothing can be mastered. And of course, at the same time, mastering breathing is not so easy. A Dr. Richard Brown, Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology at Columbia University, gave a talk in February of 2005 at the University of Massachusetts. In this talk, he spoke about stress. He said that stress is a worldwide epidemic. The number one disease of adults in the world is depression. Depression is the most extreme form of stress. He further said that if you have significant anxiety, you have twice the risk of a heart attack. If you have significant depression over time, you have four times the risk of a heart attack. He added that stress can also increase the risk of cancer at an early age. Well, we all know that we live in a stressful world. The stress response is vital for survival in times of danger. The problem only comes in when it is turned on too much, too strong, and too often. Stress increases dangerous inflammatory factors called cytokines. It damages the hippocampus and causes memory loss. Stress can cause mood disorders. It can reduce the brain's ability to repair itself. It can increase abdominal fat. And can, it can interfere with thyroid function. It even increases the stickiness of the blood which can lead to blood clots, heart attacks, or strokes. So all of those things are the bad things about stress. But let's go back to that idea that the stress response is vital for survival in times of danger. We need to think about the world we live in and the dangers we face. Obviously, our stress responses are telling us something, individually, socially, globally. There is danger out there. There is danger everywhere. And we all need to understand why that danger is there. Why our bodies are responding to stress. Our ancestors were not routinely exposed to the types of poisons that we encounter in our daily environment. We have not evolved the proper physiological machinery to break down these toxins. Today, humans are exposed to more toxic chemicals than at any other time in their evolution on this planet. Early in the 20th century, farmers didn't try to kill all the insects in any given region. They accepted the fact that insects would be more numerous in some years and at some times. 
During the bad years, they sprayed some pesticides that were toxic to the insects, but not very deadly to people. But during the 1940s, DDT and other related petrochemicals were developed into sprays for killing malaria-carrying mosquitoes. These new pesticides were very effective. They destroyed many mosquitoes and also the helpful insects and many other species. DDT-type pesticides were cheap and could be produced from plentiful crude oil supplies. Farmers, corporations, and consumers were excited by this. Now they could kill all the bugs, save all the crops, and make lots of money. In the cities, people were spraying DDT everywhere. If the first spraying didn't work, you could spray again, kill even more bugs. These people didn't realize that the bugs had tremendous reproduction capacities, and some of them always survived, and those that survived produced millions of baby bugs that were not affected by the poisons. So we are immersed in a poisonous environment because petrochemical toxins are fat-soluble. They permeate all biological membranes, including human skin, the skin of fruits and vegetables. Toxic chemicals saturate our food. They saturate the newspapers that you read and handle with your hands and then touch your body. The cars that you drive load the air with toxic chemicals. Computer chips that drive office machinery. You know, if you set up a computer or television, take it out of the box, set it up, turn it on, you can smell the toxic solvents evaporating off the equipment for weeks. Poisons are everywhere. On the vegetables you eat, the office where you work, the schools where you study, and even in your home. Nietzsche once said that if it doesn't kill you, it will make you stronger. But there's another saying, the straw that broke the camel's back. Anybody, at any time, can become overwhelmed by physiological stress. Toxic bodies. That's one of the main contributors to the stresses in our environment. And as I mentioned, human beings did not evolve in a toxic environment, either physically or psychologically. So we have psychological stressors, fear responses, and we have physical stressors from the toxicity in our environment that makes us less able to withstand the psychological stress that we are subjected to. And we go round and round and round, getting more and more stressed every day. We've talked a great deal about detoxing the body on our websites. And, of course, our main work is focused at detoxing the mind and the emotions, sorting out unhealthy programming from childhood, from society, from religion, helping the person free up their creativity so he or she can face our realities with some equanimity and balance. But clearly, the storm of toxicity in our world has increased to such a pitch that we need stronger methods and techniques. And that is what this program is all about. That is what we are going to talk about today. There is something very simple you can do to alleviate the effects of stress and assist the detoxification of your body, mind, and emotions. Well, it's not exactly accurate to say simple because it does need application and consistent application. But in a certain sense, it is simple. You just simply stimulate your vagus nerve. The vagus nerve controls the relaxation response through the transmitter acetylcholine. Vagal nerve stimulation therapy using a pacemaker-like device implanted in the chest is a treatment that's been used since 1997 to control seizures in epilepsy patients. Now get this, they are using a pacemaker-like device surgically implanted in the chest to stimulate the vagus nerve which controls seizures in epilepsy patients and there are simple ways to stimulate the vagus nerve yourself. In this device, every two to five minutes, this little machine stimulates the vagus nerve, causing your diaphragm to contract. It's recently even been approved in the U.S. for the treatment of depression and works about as well as antidepressants. 
problem is it has to be surgically implanted and this little gadget is going to set you back by about $25,000 and I'm not sure that that includes the surgical implantation either and it only stimulates the left vagus nerve and it only affects a small portion of the vagus nerve vagus nerve stimulation may also be achieved by what is called a vagal maneuver one of these vagal maneuvers consists of just holding your breath for a few seconds as you do when you want to stop the hiccups another is dipping your face in cold water coughing sharply tensing your stomach muscles as if to bear down to have a bowel movement patients with supraventricular tachycardia atrial fibrillation and other illnesses are being trained to perform these vagal maneuvers to keep their heartbeat regular studies have been done on the effects of electronic vagal stimulation and these have shown that this little gadget induces the release of hormones such as prolactin vasopressin and oxytocin oxytocin is known as the cuddle hormone if a group of animals come together in a social context they release a lot of oxytocin it's also released during childbirth and during sexual activity as well as during breastfeeding serotonin reuptake inhibitors that is antidepressants activate oxytocin release so let's think a little bit about this vagus nerve if stimulating the vagus nerve is the key to sorting out your stress as we imagine from all of the above details I think we need to know just a little bit about where it comes from and what it does the vagus nerve enters the brain stem it then splits into what's called an upper root that stimulates the thalamus which affects the cortex which is the thinking part of your brain and a lower path that goes into the limbic system or the emotional brain once again we are reminded of the fact that stress is a response to danger in the environment it's the species specific programmed reaction to threats to our survival we need to think about the fact that all of us are feeling some sort of reaction to something in our environment that scares the hell out of us and it is species specific to the majority of human beings to be feeling this right now with our world in its present state and on its present trajectory otherwise there wouldn't be an epidemic of stress and stress induced disease but there is a small minority that apparently do not feel this species specific reaction to the conditions of our world in fact they seem to be in charge of creating those conditions I think that you should give that just a little bit of thought our bodies are telling us something and we need to be listening in the meantime we need to learn how to deal with our stress so back to our vagus nerve both the right and the left vagus nerves descend from the brain in the carotid sheath lateral to the carotid artery the carotid artery as you may know is that artery on the side of your neck where you can put your fingertips and you can feel your heartbeat there it extends through the jugular foramen down below the head to the neck chest and abdomen where it contributes to the innervation of the viscera that is it's connected directly to your gut stimulating the vagus nerve you can affect the high root from the thalamus to the cortex when you affect the cortex in this way you produce what is called sensory motor rhythm or SMR this is an activated pattern in the parietal cortex that is associated with the state of relaxed vigilance in other words it makes you very aware and very alert but at the same time you are relaxed and not stressed animals or humans exhibiting SMR show improved sleep digestion thinking and memory it's also been said that this SMR state prevents you from craving drugs and overeating apparently you can achieve all of these benefits by self stimulation of the vagus nerve via controlled breathing exercises remember the left and right vagus nerves pass between the trachea and the esophagus breath training that induces stimulation of the vagus nerves reduces sympathetic nervous system over arousal it increases parasympathetic nervous system activity which is the relax recuperate and regenerate system this calms you down 
The important key here is that the beneficial effects of controlled breathing on the vagus nerve occur primarily during exhalation. During exhaling, your heart rate decelerates, and during the period of deceleration of the heart, the vagus becomes active. Shallow, rapid breathing patterns inhibit the vagus because the period of vagal activity is too short. By slowing down your breathing, you create more vagal activity, accentuating its relaxing and regenerating effects. Not only is breath the engine of the sounds that we make, deep inhalations and exhalations are inextricably linked with emotionality and altered states. To the Chinese, breath had the metaphorical importance that we give to blood. To them, breath was life. To breathe was to be. And to breathe deeply was to move your chi, which was considered by them to be the energy of your soul. The diaphragm is your primary breathing muscle. It's a thin, wide sheet of muscle that separates your thoracic cavity from your lower abdominal cavity. It has a high dome shape when it contracts as it does when you breathe, or should be doing when you breathe. It flattens out. In other words, it's like a plunger. It's like a high domed rubber thing, and then when you smash it flat, it creates pressure in one direction and creates a suction, a vacuum, in the upper thoracic cavity. Since the watery viscera, your intestines, and so forth, cannot be compressed, they get out of the way. And where do they go? They go out. The abdominal contents are forced down and out so that when you inhale with your diaphragm, your belly expands. That is why good breathing practice is usually described as abdominal breathing or belly breathing. Now, everybody in Western culture is upset by the very idea of having a bulging belly. We spend our time going around sucking it in and keeping it flat, and people naturally, as a result of social and cultural programming, tend not to want to breathe with their bellies. So they breathe very shallowly so that their belly won't move. This is very bad. When people don't breathe well, they tend to breathe in reverse. That is, the movement of their abdomen during respiration is the opposite of what is normal and healthy. Instead of letting the belly move outward during inhalation, they try to suck it in. And when they exhale, they are no longer in any danger of having their belly bulge out and make them look bad, so that's when they relax it. So everybody is breathing in reverse. In other words, most people don't use their diaphragms to breathe. Now the thing is, exhaling without the diaphragm is not a big deal. It's inhaling that's the problem. Without inhaling with the diaphragm, it's very hard work for your body because somehow or other, you're going to have to get the rib cage to lift and expand so that you can create that vacuum so that the lungs will fill with air. The only muscles that are really designed for serious rib lifting are the intercostals, and they can only do so much. People end up recruiting the pectoralis minors, the sternocleidomastoids, and the scalene muscles. Imagine a handful of muscles the size of pencils trying to lift your rib cage several times per minute, all day long, every day, day after day, week after week, year after year. Given their privileged position and peculiar significance, the scalenes are powerful agents of change and release of emotional states. Linked to this is the fact that these muscles are controlling the neck, and the neck is where the vagus nerve passes between the trachea and the esophagus. Now, in order to stop breathing with your chest and throat muscles, which is the wrong way to breathe, even though this is what many people do, you have to relearn how to breathe with your diaphragm. This is a little bit hard because the diaphragm is a muscle you can't see. You can't feel it directly. It's this big sheet of muscle that divides your thorax from your lower abdominal cavity, way inside your body. 
It's not like a muscle in your arm which you can tense and feel directly what's doing. To learn to use your diaphragm, you have to make results visible. Lie down on your back, place the book on your belly, and then take a deep breath. Remember, the object is not to move this book by tensing your belly muscles. The object is to move the book by pushing down on the viscera and having the viscera force the book to move up. It's absolutely impossible to contract your diaphragm without your belly moving out. So if you're doing this correctly, that book should move up and down. Usually, when you first try this, you can get the book to move hmm, two inches. You want to work on this to the point where you can get that book to move at least four inches every time you contract your diaphragm and take a breath. The object is, again, to move the book with your breathing, not by clenching some abdominal muscles and forcing the book in the air. It must be done by the act of breathing. If you think back and remember, in early childhood, whenever you felt like you were in trouble, you just knew you were in trouble, or whenever you felt stressed, when something went wrong, or you were being oppressed or punished, or something bad was happening around you, a situation was unpleasant or uncomfortable, you were probably holding your breath. As you grew older, and you became aware of the sociocultural norms of having a flat stomach, Added to this was the increased tendency to suppress your breathing. So all through your life, you've learned to breathe the wrong way. Shallow breath and emotional constipation go together. If you breathe shallowly, you're emotionally constipated, and that's all there is to it. And they can only be fixed together. Obviously, the best cure for shallow breathing is learning how to breathe deeply. Bioenergetic, or round breathing, was pioneered in a psychotherapeutic context by Carl Jung and popularized by his student Alexander Lowen. It's also similar to what the Chinese refer to as round breathing. When you exercise, there is a strong metabolic demand for intense respiration. Your body needs oxygen, and it needs it more urgently, and it also needs to get rid of carbon dioxide and other cellular respiration byproducts. In such a situation, breathing very fast and hard makes sense physiologically. However, when you breathe hard just for the heck of it, without some physical demand being made on your body, something completely different happens. Hyperventilation type breathing tends to cause three allegedly harmless but definitely alarming side effects, paresthesia, tetanus, and tremors. Our breathing program is not based on hyperventilation, though there are small sections of it where quick breathing is going to be employed. If this quick breathing makes you the least bit uncomfortable, do not do it. You will see that our faster breathing phase is much slower than hyperventilation and is controlled and preceded and followed by very deep breathing techniques so that the vagus nerve can be properly stimulated. I think that you can get rapid, better, more enduring results with my program and my experience and the experiences of many others that I've worked with show that deep, regular breathing with long periods of exhalation with emptying the lungs completely and carefully each time you breathe and also using the proper meditation techniques will safely and rapidly get you to where you want and need to be in control of your stress and therefore your life. Doing regular, deep breathing exercises, as I'm going to teach you, may indeed lead you to emotional releases. Maybe not the first time you practice, but there will be deep emotional releases at some point in your exercises. Sometimes they happen in dreams. Many people feel like crying, feeling sad or angry and frustrated or calm in experiences at one point or another in the regular practice of this program. Some people may feel like they want to hit something, and having a big fluffy pillow on hand for that purpose is very therapeutic. For most of us, oceans of sadness exist inside us, oceans of pain because of the hurts that we have experienced and the realization of the hurts that we've done to others. 
These kind of things can be deeply released if you practice controlled breathing regularly. And once they are released, they no longer lurk in your subconscious, controlling your emotions, causing anxiety, depression, fear, panic, and other life-destroying emotional states. The big difference between the way it is done in yoga and the way I'm going to teach you is that you breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. There is a reason for this. Many years ago, I was taught a nifty hypnotic technique where the instructor told the class that breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth induced right and left brain synchronization. So I prefer to call my technique pipe breathing to distinguish it from ujjayi breath because effectively that is what it is. When you practice pipe breathing, you breathe with the glottis partly closed. The glottis is the opening at the upper part of the larynx between the vocal cords. It's another muscle in the body that you can't see, yet you use it all the time. The glottis is the combination of the vocal cords and the space between them. When you speak, you are deliberately vibrating the vocal cords and air is passing through the glottis. And when you sing, you're performing some amazing glottal maneuvers. But here we want to constrict the glottal opening just a little bit, not enough to produce actual sounds as in speech or singing, but enough to get almost to the point of producing sound. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it's easy. Now, when you speak or sing, all kinds of muscles in your throat go into action. And if you pay close attention to it, you will notice that the constricting of the glottis preparatory to emitting a sound is also accompanied by other constriction feelings in the throat. This is very similar to the feeling you get just before and just after you swallow. And it's especially pronounced if you swallow something very cold. Say you take a drink on a hot day and you go <sighs> or ha. <sighs> so you have at that ha <sighs> moment, you have that ha <sighs> ha. <sighs> Constriction on your pharyngeal passage is just a slight constriction in the, in the entire passage. Say, ha. Say, ha. Ha. And feel the constriction. Ha. 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 And when you do it, sometimes you can hear, you can feel the glottis vibrating just a little bit, almost to the point of producing a real speech sound. Ha. Ha. Hear that? Hear that? Hear vibrate? <sighs> now we want to back off just a bit so that your throat is in this constricted state but not to the point of producing sounds. It's like what you do when you want to blow a little steam onto your glasses just before you wipe them. Let's have a pair of glasses here, see? And you go... <sighs> Now, did you feel that? Now, if you've really gotten some focus on that feeling of constricting the glottis, and you can hold that constriction during the entire time you're breathing in and out, then you are pipe breathing. Okay, now let's try it. I'm going to try to demonstrate this. And it's not going to be so easy because I'm going to try to breathe with a little bit of an exaggeration so that it comes through on the sound system a little more clearly. Let's try breathing with your mouth closed. Breathe in through the nose with that constriction in place. Now remember, get the constriction right. You know, it's the... Okay, hold that. Hold that constriction. And then close your mouth. And while you're holding it, breathe in through the nose. OK, 
Okay, got that? Let's try it again. Get your constriction set up. Now, can you do that? Okay, let's do it again. Get your constriction set up. Like you're blowing on your glasses, you know. Now keep the constriction, hold it. Okay. Now, that's what it sounds like when you're breathing in with that constriction. Now, let's do it breathing out through the mouth. As soon as you breathe in, I'm going to, I'm going to have to breathe in first in order to demonstrate it. So I'm going to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth so that you can hear how it sounds when you breathe out with the constriction. Okay, ready? Did you see what I did? You breathe in through the nose and then you slightly part your lips and breathe out through slightly parted lips and then when you go to breathe in again your lips just naturally close and then see now it sounds a little bit like Darth Vader or it sounds like the way you breathe when you're just going to sleep and you're almost on the verge of sleep and maybe you snore a little bit okay now, let's try breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, only we're going to make a very breathy ha sound, okay, as we exhale. This is going to help you to have a practice. Okay, let's do it. That's going to help you with this, practicing this out breath. Okay, now let's try it without the ha sound again because that ha is just to teach you how to feel that constriction. Ready? Now that's how it's done. Now we're going to try it to a count. Okay? It's a little strange at first. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of it. And once you do, you'll be doing efficiently what we call pipe breathing. What we're going to do with pipe breathing when we get into the next segment of the program is we're going to use it in various positions, doing various activities, and you're going to be asked to do it to a count. You're going to be asked to breathe into a particular count, hold, and then out to a particular count. Now it's a little hard for me to count and breathe at the same time, so I'm going to be thinking my count while I demonstrate this for you. Then I will tell you the count. Ready? Let's go. Now the count for me was in, one, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, hold, two, three, in, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, hold, two, three, and so on. <clears throat> 
It really depends on how fast you count or how slow you breathe, what numbers you get. I prefer this count because the numbers are easy to remember. Six in, three hold, nine out, which is just a little bit longer than the six in, and then three for the hold. And when I use the word in, that counts as one number. So in, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three. See, so that the word is, is standing in place of a number. So some of you may be able to do it longer than I can do it. You may be able to breathe deeper than I do. Or maybe some of you are not able to breathe as long as I do. You may have a little trouble exhaling as long as I do. But you notice what I do is I exhale for this long count and I just keep pushing the air out, emptying my lungs. Did you notice that the exhalation portion of the breath is longer than the inhalation? It is during that exhalation portion that your vagus nerve is being stimulated and this is the most important factor and this is why the exhalation is a little longer. So let's try it one more time. Breathe in, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, hold, two, three, in, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, hold, two, three, and stop, relax. Belly breathing. That's the basic breathing technique of pipe breathing, and it is the most important part of this program, second only to the meditation portion. You need to be practicing this as often as you can. Whenever you feel stressed, sitting at your desk, riding in your car, if you feel particularly tired, you notice yourself yawning a lot or taking deep sighing breaths <sighs> because you feel like you're not getting enough oxygen, you can immediately employ this breathing technique and begin to stimulate your vagus nerve, which then puts you into that state of alert restfulness. Alert and aware, but at the same time relaxed and restful. Also remember that when you are doing this, you are supposed to be breathing with your diaphragm. Always belly breathe. So you've got several exercises that you can practice immediately. You've got your belly breathing exercises, you've got your, breath, your, your pipe breathing, and practicing breathing with uh, the diaphragm. Remember lying on your back with the book on your belly with your knees up and learn to push that book up and down. Get, see if you can get it to move three or four inches just by the act of breathing. Then practice your pipe breathing. You can practice pipe breathing and stimulate your vagus nerve. With practice you can even get the pipe breathing so smooth that you can do it in such a way that you make almost no sound at all while you're doing it. That way you can even do it at your desk at work even if somebody sits close to you. If your boss comes in, puts a deadline on you, you have to work late, or he tells you that your pay is going to be cut 20%, your vacation has been canceled, you can immediately begin pipe breathing and reduce your stress. When you do practice your pipe breathing exercise, do it in groups of 12. Do 12 breaths, you know, in and out 12 times. And of course, in each pipe breath, you in, hold, out, hold. And then after the set of 12, just return to your normal be belly breathing, which you should be doing all the time anyway. You can do pipe breathing several times throughout the day if you need to. This practice will enable you to control your stress anytime you want or need to. And that really is how simple it is. It just needs application. You need to learn how to do it and then you need to apply it and you will be astonished at the results. But of course the most astonishing results are going to come to you when you put the pipe breathing together with the breathing exercises and with the finishing touch which is the meditation program and I think you're going to be more than amazed at the results that you're going to be having in your life from practicing Aruolus breathing and meditation program. So this is the end of the introductory portion of the program. You'll need to have practiced pipe breathing a number of times before the view of the next segment in which we're going to lead you through the exercises that are going to show you how to use the breathing technique in special ways. These will help your body to begin the process of detoxification. 
Following that will be the super powerful meditation technique. I use it myself. I developed it over 20 years ago. And the results in my life have been extraordinary. Thank you.